luck, destiny, fate, will, fortune. All words that describe the predetermined path of our lives. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, you will not be able to break free of your path, as, as your, your path, path is already set in stone. stone. This, this path, path has, has another, another name, name, that name being the flow. flow. The flow of calamity. In July of 1981, Queen was recording songs for an album, when a nearby Ziggy Stardust himself, David Bowie, cut wind of Mr. Bad Guy and his cohort's whereabouts. With a hearty amount of snow and a healthy amount of wine, the five some spent their day jamming out, but pretty soon things took a serious turn. Bowie said, This is stupid, why don't we just write one? What transpired next is one of the strangest occurrences in musical history, as both David Bowie and Freddie Mercury went into separate recording booths each freestyling vocals off the top of their heads. The most interesting part is that neither of them knew what each other were saying until after mixing the song. This should not have worked or made something even semi-coherent, but for some strange miracle or stroke of calamity, it did. And the fusion of these two music legends created one of, if not the best song, ever made. The story to Under Pressure is not dissimilar to the story behind the miracle that is the protagonist of Jojolian, Josuke Higashikata. Josuke is the fusion between Josufumi Kujo and Yoshikage Kira, the alternate universe versions of the protagonist and villain from Part 4, Diamond is Unbreakable. Though you would be completely mistaken because Josufumi and Kira are completely different characters than they were previously. Josufumi is an anti-social college student with abandonment issues, who clings onto anybody who shows him an ounce of affection. This clingy attitude often ends up being to his detriment. The people he attaches to always end up betraying him or exiting his life, leaving him endlessly lost and alone, so when he meets Kira, he has his guard up as the two work together to secure the Lokakaka fruit. This business venture eventually traps them both in a corner, a corner that only one of them can get out of. Joseph Humi considers taking that chance and leaving Kira to die, since he thinks Kira will just inevitably abandon him. I guess it makes no difference if I do the abandoning first. But to Joseph Humi and the reader's surprise, Yoshikage Kira tells him to run to move on without him, sacrificing himself for Josufumi. Yoshikage Kira in this universe is both very similar and a far cry to his part 4 counterpart. At first, Kira meets our expectations as somebody who is cold and unforgiving, while being obsessed with the fine details of life. He can be a bit of a bully to others that he feels society would be better off without, people that are indifferent about their lives and can't decide between one thing or another. Though this is where the similarities between Kira and his original counterpart end and the similarities between another, more unlikely character begin, that character being one, Jotaro Kujo. Kira often acts like an edgy 17 year old, not because he's trying to come off as cool, but because as I mentioned before, he doesn't really like people in general. Though much like Jotaro, the people he does like, he cares deeply for, such as his mother, Holly Kira. He's willing to go as far as to sacrifice his own life for them, which he does for his new friend, Josefumi. In an attempt to repay his kindness, Josefumi performs an equivalent exchange, giving his life for Kira so Kira can save Holly. Though due to a stroke of calamity, all the correct ingredients come together to create a miracle. Under pressure of the wall eyes, Josefumi and Kira fuse to form a whole new person. A whole new person that should not have been born, but for some strange miracle or stroke of calamity, was. Creating my favorite Jojo character ever, Josuke Higashikata. Josuke wakes up not knowing who he is or where he came from. He's a blank state, a baby in this world. The only reason he has a name is because he was given one by Yasuo Hirose, the girl who found him unconscious on the shoreline of Morio. Like Josefumi, Josuke very quickly latches onto Yasuo, as she is the first to show him kindness. Though like Kira, she's willing to do anything to protect her, going as far as killing anyone who tries to harm her, often hindering his goal of finding out his identity. The closer and closer Josuke gets to finding out where he came from, the more and more it becomes his obsession, forming his own version of Jolene and Johnny's Dark Determination. Though I don't think that it's until he finds out about his fusion, does Josuke become a much more interesting character. He realizes that he doesn't even have a past to begin with. Because he's a blank slate, he feels alone, like he doesn't fit in anywhere in society. So then, what's the point of living? 
Josuke's birth may appear as a miracle, but to him, it's a curse. This is where his main goal comes into play, to save Holly Akira. Much like her Part 3 counterpart, Holly is deathly ill from a disease not curable by man. So her son, Yoshikage Akira, was looking for a cure when he stumbled upon the Lokakaka, a fruit that will heal anyone, but at the cost of equivalent exchange. This means that when it heals something, it must take something. So if you want to heal a chopped off arm, it will heal, but in return, it will take something from you. Oftentimes it will take something small like your teeth or nose, but it could also take something much worse like your brain or the life of another person. Unfortunately, Kira dies before he is able to heal Holly. So out of obligation, Josuke decides to pick up the torch and hunt for the Lokakaka. Though throughout Jojolian, Josuke's altruistic goal changes to that of a much more selfish one, a desire to belong. Once he discovers that he's the fusion between Josefumi and Kira, he realizes that nobody, not a single person cared enough to search out for him. Josefumi's parents were out of the picture, neither of the two seem to have any friends and who knows what Kay's deal is, meaning the only person he has left is a slowly dying Holly Kira. Without her, what proof of identity does he have? That he is an actual tangible person that exists, and isn't just some Frankenstein born of some curse that he belongs somewhere with a family, friends, anybody. It's no secret that Hirohiko Araki has insanely improved when it comes to his character writing during his nearly 40 long year career as a mangaka. Look no further than the protagonists. While I detest pretty much everything else about Stone Ocean, for more on that check out my Jojo ranking video. But the one thing I will give it is it introduced the most nuanced protagonist up until that point in the series, Jolene. While character development wasn't exactly absent, pretty much every JoJo stayed the same, as lovable as they were. Jolene, though, was the first protagonist to evolve and change over the course of her respective part, giving her a much more human-like feel than anybody before her. This was further improved with Johnny in Steel Ball Run, and now perfected with Josuke in Jojolian. Near the end of the story when Holly and, I guess, Kay, the two people Josuke had left, sacrificed themselves for his sake, he has a revelation. These people didn't die for him so he could throw on the towel just because he doesn't have some proof that he was somebody. They gave their lives for Josuke so he could live on, not as somebody else, but himself. He may be the fusion of two people, but Josuke is still a person. Not a cursed amalgamation of limbs shoved together, but a second chance granted to him by the flow of calamity. So instead of focusing on his past, he chooses to focus on himself. He chooses to focus on making a better future for himself, and his new family. To not waste the miracle of life breathed into him by Calamity. Because he isn't just Fumi Kujo, he isn't Yoshikage Kira, he is no one other than Josuke Higashikata. But the one thing standing in Josuke's way are the rock humans. Nobody knows why rock humans exist. Not scientifically speaking, but spiritually speaking. In Jojolian, the idea is presented that rock humans were created by whatever higher power there is in Jojo as a backup if regular humans failed and fizzled out. Though luckily for us, we didn't, leaving rock humans in a strange limbo. They still exist in society and assimilate with other humans. They can even have relationships with humans. Sadly, almost always these relationships end in failure or worse, murder. Often leaving the rock humans only ever forming relationships for social status so they can rise up in the world and make a name for themselves. In strange cases, rock humans will also work with other rock humans to achieve a goal. This is the case with the Lokakaka organization found in Jojolian, a society of rock humans who sell and trade Lokakaka fruits for exorbitant prices, reserving them only for the uber-rich. Their goal is to perfect the Lokakaka in order to bring a massive societal change that puts rock humans on the bottom and regular humans on the top. Where I find the rock humans interesting narratively is in their similarities to Josuke. By all means, rock humans shouldn't exist. They're a leftover fallback plan from the creation of the universe. The only way they've been able to survive is by evolving the process in which they are born. This process is very demanding, as when rock humans are born, they are abandoned by their mothers in the middle of the forest, forced to fend for themselves for 17 years alone. The first thing they experience when they become adults is the strangeness of human society a strangeness they will never understand. They have no family, friends, or anybody to help them, just left on their own. To make matters worse, when rock humans die, they crumble into dust, not leaving any corpse behind. So like Josuke, they desperately try to find any accomplishment that they can achieve, any place to leave their mark and prove that they existed, that they didn't just live for nothing. 
the ultimate portrayal of this desperation is Toru. Toru is introduced pretty late to Jojolian, as the leader of the Lokaka organization, wielding, so far, the strongest stand in all of Jojo's, Wonder of You. When I did a reread of Jojolian for this video, I realized that it's less of an alternate reality version of Part 4, and more of an alternate reality Part 5. Think about it. The protagonist is a strange fusion of both a former protagonist and an antagonist. One of the central themes of the story is fate and taking control of it. Fights aren't really whimsical. They are much more dangerous and often end with somebody dying. The central antagonists are all a part of the multi-layered crime organization, working under a boss whose stand can manipulate fate. In this case, it's Calamity. How Wonder of You works is whenever you pursue it or its user with harmful intent, Calamity, aka bad luck, will strike against you. This Calamity can range from you bumping into a door, or to just straight up dying from a heart attack. Wonder of You is definitely one of my favorite stands in the series, one that Toro uses exceptionally well to maintain his goal. Since his birth around 87 years ago, he has built up an empire from scratch. He will do anything to maintain it, to maintain and leave a lasting effect on the world. Throughout his brief time in Jojolian, even when all of his subordinates have been killed by Josuke, he remains entirely calm and composed due to his strong belief that he will prevail. When he is inevitably defeated, slowly dying, do we see his true self. Desperately clinging to life, he loses all composure panicking, screaming, frantically begging not to be killed. He watches as everything he's done, all of his achievements crumble away into dust, just like he is. Toru was an amazing villain, one of the best in all of Jojo, but he has two major problems that hold him back. None of them have anything to do with his character, but more mistakes on Araki's part. That first mistake being that Toru had little to no buildup, and it was kind of just hastily plopped into our laps during the final act. The way that he was slowly revealed to be the villain was cool, but it doesn't really fit well in this part. Jojolian was, for the most part, such a carefully crafted narrative that Toru's reveal just kind of feels sloppy. It feels even more sloppy when Araki tried to convince us that Toru was actually there the entire time with awkward Yasuo flashbacks. The least we could have gotten was other rock humans either hinting at or alluding to Toru. I could totally see Damo mentioning a figure called the Boss, or the Head Doctor, to Norisuke during Vitamin C. The real kicker though is that Jojolian already had a character who fits this bill perfectly, with Toru's second major problem being the fact that he's not Jobin. At the beginning of Jojolian, Josuke is accepted into the very wealthy Higashikata family by the father and head of the family, Norsuke Higashikata. Right off the bat you can tell that Norsuke's actions weren't entirely altruistic. While he's a good person and genuinely cares for Josuke, he also needs him. He was previously working with Yoshikage Kira and finding the Lokakaka, and he hopes that Josuke can do the same if he regains his memories. Norsuke is trying to cure the rock disease, a curse of unknown origin that has affected the Higashikatas for multiple generations. The curse always manifests in the firstborn child when they reach the age of 11, slowly turning their bodies into stone before killing them. Though thanks to Johnny Joestar, the Higashikatas found a way to transfer the rock disease onto somebody else often ending in the mother taking on the rock disease for their child before dying in the process. That's what Norsuke's mother did for him as a child, and it is what he might have to do for his grandson, Tsuruji Higashikata. So he goes out in search of the Lokakaka, hoping to put an end to the curse for good before that happens. But he has rules, moral rules, that prevent him from doing anything ruthless to achieve his goal. While it's never clearly stated why he chose to follow what he calls the right path, my guess is that he has always been so he doesn't leave behind a poor legacy. That his children won't remember him as some ruthless killer for a cause. Instead, they'll know that you can achieve your goals, and do it while following the right path. Norske is a family man, first and foremost, always looking out for his children and hopes to, even after his passing, by setting a good example, like any loving parent would do. Though the same can't be said for Jobin Higashikata. One of the best moments in all of Jojolian is when we first get to meet Jobin. Up until this point, he has been mentioned multiple times. We've already met his wife and son, and on the family tree, his name is the only one without a picture next to it. So when he just randomly enters the story in chapter 33, it is almost terrifying. It starts with Josuke having accidentally spilled food on Jobin. Jobin returns the favor by immediately stealing the scene. All he does is stare back at Josuke with a face of disgust, anger, and tension, or possibly worse, something that we as readers couldn't hope to pinpoint in a million years. Josuke nervously apologizes and Jobin 
carefully choosing his words says, it's okay to make mistakes right, you're only human after all. Tensions are high, and anything could happen next. And anything does happen next. Norsuke comments that Jobin quoted Mitsuo Aida, a famous Japanese poet that the two share a passion for. They laugh their butts off while Norsuke welcomes Jobin back from his trip. All of the tension immediately leaves the room to show Jobin's more lovable, childlike side. As you can see, Norsuke and Jobin are very close to one another. Not just because they're father and son, but the two are pretty much business partners. Jobin helps Norsuke run the Higashikata Fruit Company, a corporation that sells, grows, and trades fruits. Norsuke takes great pride in the company, placing heavy importance on quality over quantity when it comes to his products. Something that Jobin and Norsuke don't see eye to eye on. Since his introduction, you can tell that something's off with Jobin. That behind that silly attitude, poetry, golden Lamborghini, and beetle obsession, the animal not the band sadly, he's hiding a sinister secret. He's hiding a sinister secret. The secret ends up being his connections to the rock humans, as he's working with them to secure the Lokakaka fruit. Jobin does a lot of awful things behind Norske's back. Things that stray from the right path is father laid forth. Though, though in his eyes, that's completely justified because what he's doing is for a good cause. What I love about Jobin is that he's a villain with the best of intentions. He loves his family, just as much as Norske does. So much so that he's willing to stray from the right path, cross any moral boundary to protect them. And his way of protecting his family is to ensure their social status at the top, and while he loves his dad, he feels that Norske's morals are what hold the company back from achieving its full potential. So he decides to get in on the Lokakaka business when he could, and now he desperately needs to. His son Suruji is going to die soon if he can't perform an equivalent exchange with Lokakaka. Almost all of Dojolian is a race, a race between Josuke and Jobin to see who can get to the Lokakaka first. This all comes to a climax in chapter 95 as Suruji is screaming in pain from his disease, Yasuo is drowning right next to him, and worst of all, the entire Higashikata family has seen Jobin's secrets laid out to bear, including Norsuke, the person Jobin looked up to the most. All of the people that he's killed, and all the horrible things he's done, the cat is out of the bag. Jobin tries to convince his dad that what he's been doing is according to the right path, to look past all of it and let Yasuo drown. Though it's of no use, as Norisuke tries to save her, Jobin does the unthinkable. With tears streaming down his face, begging for forgiveness, he kills his father. In his last moments, knowing he's going to die, Norisuke has a deep sadness in his eyes. Not angry, not even disappointed, but sad as he looks at Jobin, collapsing to the ground. Jobin cries over his father's body, realizing what he's done, realizing that the consequences of thinking what he was doing was the best for his family. In the end, he only splintered them apart. When the rest of the family rushes towards Norisuke, Jobin snaps. Pointing right at them, he says, you better be prepared, otherwise, close your mouths. We, the Higashikata family, are moving forward on this path, the right path. This is the best moment in all of Jojolian, because Araki had been carefully lining up each and every domino for them all to fall right into place. Now Jobin has control of the family, who knows what he's going to do. Jobin's death is by far the worst part of Jojolian. I don't mean that it's because I like Jobin and I'm sad that he's gone, I mean narratively, this is Araki's second biggest narrative mistake in his career, right behind the horrible part 5 flashback ending. I get that him being killed by Toru is supposed to show that Calamity can strike indiscriminately, but we already had that point hammered home since three other characters would die from Calamity and the love interest would have her arm chopped off. So this just felt so unnecessary. Especially after Jobin just had his best moment and the story had so much potential going forward that it's stupid. Luckily, the story pretty much immediately picks back up from here with Peak, but up until the last chapter, Jobin's unsatisfactory death leads a horrible taste in your mouth. This is one of my two major complaints concerning the story of Jojolian, the second being the insane amount of plot holes. The final chapters are great, but also feel like Araki was just frantically cramming in all the stuff that he didn't have time to bring back in full, like Carrera, Kei, and Kato. This also leaves a lot of plot holes like Flashback Man, the dude that was shown in Josuke's flashback as a prominent figure at the very beginning of Jojolian, but never mentioned once again. You would think for a mystery slash detective story 
everything would have to be airtight, which is very much not the case in Jojolian. Still though, Jojolian is my favorite Jojo part. No matter how many times I reread it, I am always able to appreciate it more and more, especially the ending. I'm not one for endings that... I'm not... I'm not... I'm not... I'm not one for endings that are supposed to be up to your interpretation. When I get invested in this story, I expect it to carry me to a satisfying conclusion, so to just throw me off the bus and say you're on your own never leaves a good taste in my mouth. JoJo's is no stranger to this. In fact, most endings to JoJo's parts I don't think are that great. Though I think with JoJo Lian, Araki was able to find a happy medium. It ends with the Higashikata family broken and shattered, but not without hope. To celebrate Norisuke getting out of the hospital because for some reason he's alive, they all try to choose a cake. Nobody can pick one though, because they're too distraught. So they elect Josuke to choose one, accepting him into their new family. Josuke now has a new life, one that he can build with Yasuo and his new family. One free from curses, lokakukas, rock humans, and especially calamity. One where he can build up an identity and a legacy to leave behind. Mm.